for joining us today. I am here with uh, Dr. Yevgenia Leonova, who we call Jeannie. Um, she's been working with us here at Deep Future Analytics for about five years, if I have that right, Jeannie. Um, yes, uh, I, I've been around uh, DFA since 2015, so it's actually more than <laughs> <It's> seven years. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so thank you all for joining. I know some people are still coming in, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Jeannie has been doing a lot of work on machine learning and how one combines that with vintage analysis in order to do long range forecasting. So um, she's going to present uh, work that uh, she and we here at DFA have been doing. Um, Jeannie, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Um, uh, today, we're going to talk about how to guide AI and machine learning algorithms through the economic cycle. And uh, I'll be presenting on behalf of myself and Joe. Uh, we did this together. Um, so. I'm sorry, how to... Sorry, I'm trying to start for the first slide here. And... It, it doesn't work. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So a short overview of the talk. So today we are going to talk about uh, the cases when big data is actually, is actually only a little data and uh, what it means in, in case when we want to um, use long thin data and to uh, build long run model. Um, so we are going to talk how to combine long run model with so-called in our industry scoring models. And in particular, uh, we are going to talk about the certain type of uh, long run models that we call uh, that we call vintage models and how to combine this with uh, machine learning methods uh, popular right now, like uh, neural networks and AgiBoost. And um, uh, we are going to present an example uh, that we built as a proof of concept uh, on US mortgage data. Uh, So when big data is only a little data. Um, so um, many of high-tech companies right now like Google and Amazon are leveraging a massive amount of data. And uh, the algorithms have been here for a while like uh, machine learning algorithms uh, have been since 60s, 70s, and 80s, but right now they're gaining a new life uh, due to a massive amount of data and also computational resources um, provided. Uh, so, um, but um, actually, what we call big data it is not um, is actually a really short slice of history, especially in um, banking industry. So um, we in retail lending we almost never see uh, a data set that we would call big data uh, that. Um, goes back to a recession of 2009. Um, 
In fact, what we have uh, in, in terms of time, we have only a short slice of history. Um, so what we actually have, uh, what banks provide us is uh, very basic information like defaulting accounts or attrition accounts. Um, and uh, basically what we have for every account is uh, product, um, time, of, time of attrition, time of default, uh, and uh, origination date. So that's the information that we can use to build a long run model. Um, we call it long thin data. Um, So, but big data, uh, have uh, more specific information like behavioral characteristics and uh, um, uh, basically uh, information on the individuals. Um, Okay, so it means that we, we need uh, different types of models for these different type of, uh, types of data. Um, so what we want is to use both data, both uh, long run data and uh, uh, big data. Um, uh, we are going to, so the thing is to start with a long run model um, and then use that uh, and, and then co uh, combine it with uh, uh, neural methods uh, for machine learning uh, to use both of them um, and to steer it through time. So, how to combine long-run model with uh, actually with scoring models? Um, scoring models is just a uh, um, name uh, for the machine learning algorithms uh, that we use. So, the procedure has a two-step approach. Um, First, we are going to use long thin data, and here we usually have uh, 20 years of history or more, like several decades uh, of this basic information. And so we are going to feed that into the long, -ran, uh, long range model, the methods that have been uh, around. Um, and um, um, to create a long range model, basically the long range forecast. Uh, and so we are going to use this long range forecast as an input, um, fixed input to machine learning algorithm together with big data that we have to produce uh, a forecast. So, and the keyword is there fixed. So um, uh, fixed input uh, is a certain jargon for our uh, industry. It means that we have in, in our machine learning method, we are going to use coefficient uh, and an input coefficient uh, for a, a forecast produced from um, long range model uh, and the coefficient will be 1.0. Uh, um, so in other words, what it actually means uh, is that our machine learning algorithm will be, um, will learn the residuals um, of uh, relative to the, um, long range model. 
um, and uh, independent on whether it's uh, uh, how how does the output variable looks like. Um, so, in other words, we don't want machine learning method to second guess a mean of the distribution uh, going forward. W what we want it to be, uh, we want it to learn around the account um, uh, variation of this mean produced by a long range model. So, um, our, as at the end, our forecast will look like machine learning plus uh, the, the output from the forecast from machine learning algorithm plus the, uh, the output from the long range model. Um, so how to combine long run models with scoring models? And uh, we are going to start with uh, one of the long range models uh, called APC. Um, and so H period cohort models have been um, around for a while. They were developed uh, in 1897 by a psychology professor in Germany. And uh, the basic idea is that any tem temporal, uh, temporal change um, can be attributed to three kinds of processes. The change, the first one uh, is the change of um, over the life course of an account. Uh, we call it age effect. Uh, the second one is the change due to the uh, replacement of uh, older cohorts with newer cohorts. Uh, in, in our case, it's, uh, uh, we call it credit risk function. And uh, the, the last one is the change due to the certain events in particular years. Um, in, and in our case, it's economy shocks. Um, we call it environment function. So uh, on the pictures here, you can see uh, decomposition uh, into this three function of pr probability of default, uh, the log odds of the probability of default. Um, and uh, this came from um, Freddie Mac mortgage data. Um, so Joe actually never mentions that, but he was the inventor. He was the first one who um, uh, applied this in, the, in a credit risk modeling. So he can tell you the story of how he came up with this. Um, but uh, again, so the idea is that the, we take the vintage, level data and by vintage, I mean, um, we call a vintage uh, a group of accounts that were originated in a certain window of time. So in our analysis, we were using monthly data, but you can do it with um, any kind of window like weekly or quarterly. <clears throat> um, and so we can, we, we take the aggregated vintage data and we compare every vintage, every cohort, um, say um, what January 2017 cohort uh, uh, looks like in terms of performance and how it um, can be and can be compared to other cohorts. Uh, and uh, in that comparison, we are going to assume that the formula at the bottom uh, is true. Uh, so the uh, log odds of probability of default, PD, uh, can be represented as the, as the sum of three functions. Uh, the life cycle function here, uh, 
versus the age of the account, the credit risk versus the um, cohort or vintage date, uh, and the um, environment function. So um, to stop at, ev at every one uh, of this uh, uh, life cycle function here, actually, uh, it's in the probability scale. So what you actually see the y-axis is of probability, uh, conditional probability, we, which means that we are looking at um, the <clears throat> uh, default rate on a certain date, but only among those accounts that are active on this date. So uh, this can explain why this function goes up. So why the probability of, of default goes up uh, with uh, when age in, increases, even though uh, the amount of uh, accounts in, in a cohort uh, goes down. Uh, the second function is credit risk function. And um, uh, it's in linear scale, which uh, here, so um, the central line is zero here, which means that it's additive to the um, life cycle, to the log odds of the life cycle uh, function, you can see on the first picture. Uh, and so uh, positive values of credit risk function means that it has uh, the vintages that has have higher risk comparing to the average, the lower uh, values uh, represent the lower risk compared to the average. And um, Joe actually has a research where uh, he shows that this function uh, follows like a, a little bit of what we call counter cyclical, um, which basically means that banks usually book their uh, worst accounts right before the, the recession and the best accounts uh, during and after the recession. Um, so the third function is, uh, we call it environment function, which basically shows the economic shocks. Um, and again, it's additive here. Uh, again, you can see the central line is zero. And um, the um, time, uh, period of time where the, it, we have higher values means that it's uh, more default accounts. And uh, this basically is a re recession. The lower values meaning mean that and sh show that this is the um, good times or basically the, be the best time of expansion. Um, so uh, after we decompose that, we need to create a forecast. So to create a forecast, uh, we need to extrapolate the environment function into the future using economic factors. And again, Joe, Joe has a um, research paper how to do that. Um, but um, then after we uh, extrapolated, extrapolate that, we, we add this to the credit risk for a certain vintage and life cycle. Uh, that's how we get uh, the vintage level forecast, which means the uh, average probability of default monthly for a certain vintage. And so the second step here uh, is we're going to throw away the vintage function. And we are going to replace it with a machine learning algorithm. So let's... No audio.
can you hear me now? Okay, uh, sorry for that. Um, so, uh, we are going to get rid of the vintage function here uh, and replace it with a, a machine learning algorithm like neural network. Um, and I'm not sure why it's not showing. Okay, um, so life cycle and environment function functions are still going to be an input, but instead of the vintage function, you can see it in the formula at the bottom, we are, uh, we are going to use the um, neural network in this case. Um, so this neural network is going to learn on our big data set um, and uh, uh, the network architecture would look like that uh, on the right where on the right hand side you would have uh, all inputs all behavioral and uh, uh, transactional inputs from the big data you have uh, feed forward kind of network uh, information would go to, towards the output node and on the left hand side uh, we would have this one single node um, containing the value, which would be the sum of life, uh, life cycle and in environment function for every month, uh, every single account. And uh, uh, the weight, the weights for this single node should be 1.0. Um, now, there are packages in R that can do this. And uh, in, in fact, we, we did that and we proved that it works. Uh, but uh, we're going to concentrate more of actually boost uh, today. And so it, same thing, but instead of the vintage function, we are going to replace it with actually boost uh, method, which basically an, an ensemble of uh, gradient boosted trees. Uh, it's been popular uh, for a while. Um, and Um, so let's just um, look at the results we have for US mortgage data using AgiBoost algorithm. Uh, so uh, we were using Freddie Mac data, uh, which started uh, in 2001 through 2009. We didn't use the, any data after, uh, during the uh, recession. Uh, current recession, COVID, because uh, it's just, uh, there are too many anomalies there. Uh, and there were over 1 trillion of mortgages. Uh, and we were interested in comparing actually the A, uh, our APC plus XG boost with multi-horizon survival model. Uh, so, you can find information about multi-horizon survival model uh, following this paper in parentheses, uh, Britain and Crook um, dated with, with 2020. Uh, and uh, I should say that in both of these models, uh, we actually built a separate model for every horizon. Now, uh, uh, why we did that is due to delinquency. So delinquency is very dynamic. Um, and uh, so if you say have a delinquent, three months delinquent account today, a peak of uh, uh, default risk for this account will be three months into the future, uh, considering that we, for mortgage, we define uh, default as six months uh, delinquent. Um, 
And so the same way for every other delinquency and uh, uh, from one to five. So it means that delinquency is highly nonlinear when we look at this um, over the horizon. So um, horizon into the future. Um, so the next slide uh, shows our results. We um, made three kind of uh, did three kinds of tests uh, in sample, out of sample, and out of time, out of sample. Um, so in sample test uh, were was done over three years of data uh, from 2017 until 2019. Uh, you can see the results here are good as uh, was expected. Um, and uh, uh, APC plus XGBoost model uh, performed a little better than multi-horizon survival model. Um, the out of sample test uh, is on the same period of data, but on different sample um, is almost the same, uh, which again is, uh, uh, was uh, uh, acceptable. Um, and uh, out of time, out of sample tests were performed on the data on the two years before uh, training period. So it's going to be 2015, 2016 data. And um, uh, you can see that AUC and Gini uh, characteristics dropped a little. Um, and uh, what's, what's interesting that even though uh, the multi-horizon survival and APC FG boost are very close, uh, and they are even inside the confidence intervals of each other. Uh, but um, uh, APC plus FG boost model uh, shows uh, are a, a little better uh, and sh shows consistency in this regard for every of these three tests. Um, So um, even though row curves are important, they only show how well does the model uh, rank uh, every single account between themselves. But um, uh, one of the other validation tests is, is actually to look at the aggregated um, uh, forecast that the model produces to make sure it's not biased because it can still be biased even though uh, Rockos perform well, show uh, good results. So um, uh, same kind of forecasts, three forecasts, but we, were, we are looking right now at the uh, time series aggregated uh, forecasts. And so um, uh, this, peak here around 2018, uh, this is consistent and uh, both models, you can see that over predict this com compared to history. Uh, so black line is the history here. And uh, we, uh, it's just a glitch. We think that it, the, there was a change in policy here uh, because um, it looks like the, um, there were lots of delinquent accounts that were supposed to uh, roll to default, but it didn't happen uh, due to policy change. Uh, and so uh, you can see that the models here are almost identical. So they almost show the um, uh, unbiased results. Uh, except maybe this period of time at the end for uh, gradient boosting. And um, I actually forgot to mention that we uh, gradient boosted trees, we were using 
stochastic uh, variation of this. It means that at, at every iteration uh, of training, we, uh, we would uh, take the random sample, a random sample and train on that uh, rather than using uh, the whole data every, every time. Uh, uh, it just to make sure that um, we are not stuck in any local minimum. Um, and uh, the second test, oh, sorry, the third one test is out of sample out of time, actually, where uh, gradient boost, boosted trees perform performs a little better, uh, even. Uh, uh, so it looks like it just, um, Uh, it just make use of all, all the um, make more use of the information, uh, all that behavioral information uh, we are giving. So I guess that was the last slide. Um, Great, thank you, Jeannie. Um, we're getting some questions and mm -hmm. uh, and I'll remind everybody we have time here uh, that if you want to uh, enter questions in the chat, you can do that. Um, so let me look through these quickly. Uh, one of them um, back on your vintage decomposition slide, um, mm -hmm. it showed a deterioration. Uh, it looked like in the credit quality um, over the last uh, couple of years. And so the, the question is, do we think mortgage originations got worse in the, the years leading up to uh, the pandemic because this data ends right before the pandemic? Um, now, I, I'm not sure about that because Well, usually, um, so in cases like that, uh, the this tail that we have in credit quality means that it's very young vintages, so we don't have much data on those. So um, sometimes it may be due to just because of this, um, you can uh, question the tail there. Um, Maybe Joe, maybe you have. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, you, you do see though a long trend starting back around 2015 of worse quality originations. And I think um, it's hard to know in the most recent year or two exactly how bad they are, but I think there isn't much doubt that people were getting more lax on originations in the years 2015, 16, 17. That period is definitely trending up. And for that, we have pretty good measurements at this point. Um, now what's happened since the pandemic is probably much more volatile. And uh, uh, Jeannie, I think it's the case that uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac haven't released uh, any data on the the most recent couple of years of originations. Is that right? Uh, I think that's true. Yeah. So we don't know yet. Okay. And then um, another question that came in was regarding how similar the results were for the the multi horizon survival model, which is basically vintage plus lo logistic regression as compared to the um, the vintage plus machine learning approach. And um, I'll go ahead and offer that. Um, I think the issue here is that the, yeah, that the um, data that we get from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is actually not very rich. It's a very limited set of performance indicators. So machine learning models are being used in cases where the data is highly nonlinear. And um, that can mean that uh, 
Um, in other cases with more complex data sets, um, there may be a greater distance between a machine learning approach and a, a more linear approach, but in kind of traditional data sets like um, the mortgage data we get from Fannie and Freddie and bureau data, there probably isn't a great deal of separation between what machine learning can do and, and what a, uh, a uh, more, um, I call it linear, but really the multi-horizon survival model is the, it's, a, it's a combination of nonlinear effects like life cycle and environment with um, some regression modeling. Um, it's a quote linear model, but actually a rather flexible one. So I think it's more about the data coming in. Um, does that make sense, Jeannie? Anything mm -hmm. that you would add there? Um, in fact, Jeannie, I know that you've worked on more complex data sets um, for other clients um, in this kind of machine learning plus um, vintage analysis. Did, did you see, um, can you speak to any similarities in performance there? Um, you mean as comparison with the uh, multi-horizon survival or? Yeah, I don't remember if you used a multi-horizon survival model, but I know you had a more complicated. I actually, um, can you hear me now? Uh, so I actually compared uh, APC plus, plus XG boost versus just XG boost, uh, but using, um, vintage date as an input uh, and also age. Uh, so those two show on, on, on a different data set, uh, which was much smaller uh, than mortgage data, uh, which could affect the performance, of course. So those two were very similar, uh, but uh, a good thing about uh, APC plus XG boost uh, was that it uh, learned much faster comparing to uh, just XG boost because we, we already start with a good approximation, uh, which is our long run APC model. Um, That's an excellent point that if you just turn XG boost loose on um, uh, loan performance data, it's going to use trees to try to understand uh, the embedded life cycle and environmental effects. And, and those are more continuous processes. You don't really need a tree to understand those. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I see a hand raised. Uh, uh, Jared, I'm gonna uh, let you unmute and ask a question if you've got one. Yes, thank you. On this page showing the discrimination tests, is this comparison, this is these, the joint outcome of all components of the models, right? This is not a comparison of, say, XG boost and the logistic, air quotes, linear model component, right? This is showing me the combination of Right, this is the APC combination. And environment, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I forgot to mention that is, this is actually the uh, all horizons together. So we uh, we combined all horizons together, and uh, the output variable here is um, the monthly probability of, of default. So you compare; it's not like it's cumulative probability right. du during this period of time, but monthly. So, so, so my my one comment is simply that. Um, that frame makes a lot of sense, right? Because the object of interest is a monthly default rate. Yes. However, yes. the inclusion of the environment and the vintage or life cycle functions probably induces a lot of commonality between the two experiments. And if you were to strip this down to kind of the, air, the scoring or the, the, the cohort dimension, um, it might tell you, be a little more informative about just how much 
improvement or, or difference there is between the two methods because really it, you're only substituting in for one third of the APC function in this ML model, right? Uh, well, right, but in this case, I wouldn't, you know, uh, in rock curves, you have to compare with, so the score you produce or the, uh, your forecast with some output variable. So uh, I wouldn't, I am not sure which output variable I would use uh, to compare it this just within with an output of machine learning uh, part of equation or sc scoring part of the equation in case of multi horizon survival model. Um, I I'm not sure. Um, I think you're right. You would need some kind of a synthetic output as the target that would take the real numbers mm -hmm. and adjust for life cycle and environment. You yeah. Know, you, you have to have those somewhere in order to explain what really happened. Um, now, that does mean that these, it's worth saying, this is using the real environment function. So this is an ideal situation where you know what the environment's doing. There is a separate degradation that occurs in the future if you you know you have to make a model and and guess a scenario and and have an, an economic model that predicts that environment function so we're separating effects here in the sense that this is showing the ideal performance where you know what the economy is doing um, if you have to use an economic scenario, it's going to degrade by as far off as your economic scenario is. And, and that's kind of our usual way of testing things. Okay, uh, thanks for that question, Jared. And uh, so any other uh, questions or uh, either by raising your hand or by chat? And uh, anything else come to mind, Jeannie, that you would add here? Um, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe you have some okay. additional okay. information. Well, um, I think um, if no one else has questions, I'll wrap up by pointing out that, uh, as you can see, we do a lot of work in this area. Um, and we actually have been doing a lot of work recently in validating machine learning models, uh, establishing best practices for how to do that, how to make it fair to compare a machine learning and a linear model from a validation perspective. Um, so, you know, small bit of advertisement is that if you need any assistance either in, in uh, incorporating machine learning techniques, building models like these, or, or doing uh, model validation, we're happy to help with any of those things. So if we have no further questions, I uh, thank you all for your time today. And uh, in about one month, we will have uh, Dr. Nick Dobrinoff uh, presenting uh, some of his work, um, which is related to um, model selection error, uh, looking at um, the error that comes from uh, the process of choosing one out of many candidate models and what we can say about that. It's very interesting results. So I hope you can all join us for that as well. And the registration is on our website, just as it was for here, uh, dfutureanalytics.com slash events. So hope to see you in a month. Uh, take care, everyone.